Okay, so the learning objectives for this module, uh, understand and perform marker gene-based uh, micro microbiome analysis. Uh, analysis of, we'll focus mainly on analysis of 16S ribosomal RNA marker genes. And we'll use the uh, 16S to profile and compare my microbial communities, microbiomes. And then we'll uh, so learn to how learn a little bit about selecting suitable parameters for uh, marker gene analysis, and at the end we'll have some discussion on the advantage and disadvantage of using marker ba marker gene based analysis versus uh, metagenomics analysis. Okay, so you've seen this already. Um, so the reason a lot of people choose ribosomal RNAs as their marker genes, it's because it's it's truly the a universal phylogenetic markers. It's present in all living organisms and it plays a critical role in protein translation, means that uh, the f it's functionally conserved and uh, therefore uh, the rate of mutation is uh, considerably slower than some of the more, uh, some of the um, let's say genes involved in virulence that are much more fast evolving. And, um, the ribosomal RNAs are, um, behave like a molecular clock, uh, so as a result of that it's useful for phylogenetic analysis and a uh, tree of life's been uh, built based on this particular molecule. It's mostly common, uh, it's a most common uh, marker genes by far, meaning that if you want to compare your data set to a, to a reference data set or to another uh, study, it's more likely you'll be able to do so if you have 16S sequences versus uh, other more uh, uh, other, other types of markers, uh, which we'll talk a bit as well. So RNAs uh, are called the length into life because uh, it help us place organisms into the universal phylogenetic tree. And um, we can therefore use this tool to understand the composition of a microbial community. In other words, we can profile the, the microbial community using this marker gene. Um, this process is uh, typically uh, called, uh, generates uh, what's called an alpha diversity of the community. Uh, it's also because uh, it's also a tool that can be used to relay one microbial community to another, and when you compare communities, uh, you uh, you do so by uh, doing beta diversity analysis. And um, beyond sort of the taxonomic profiling, the tool can also be useful in reading out properties of the host or the environment. We know that certain type of organisms associate with a certain type of host and certain type of environment. So you don't necessarily have to get the functional data to do uh, some functional interpretation. And Morgan will cover a little bit of that uh, uh, using uh, the tool that he developed called uh, PyCross as, a, as an example. And moreover, uh, Profile, uh, community profiles can be associated with certain host phenotype or certain environmental features. Uh, so for example, there's uh, community, bacterial community profiles associated with obese, obesity and uh, associated with uh, people with normal or lean weight. Um, and there's also diff uh, profiles associated with different types of diseases. And the more you characterize these communities, the better you can infer uh, functions um, using just the, the marker genes as a, as a proxy for your analysis. So briefly, uh, here's a list of different marker genes that have also been used. Uh, for eukaryotic organisms, the most common marker is the 18S um, ribosomal RNA gene. It's the equivalent of the 16S. Um, and the, the most common database is, uh, most popular one anyway, is pr provided by Silva, and it's uh, provided in this link here. Uh, another common uh, 
marker is the the ITS the, the inter um, in uh, in um, what's the ITS stand for? inter uh, transcript uh, part in yeah uh, transcript spacer so it's a space between the the RNA genes and as I mentioned earlier on it uh, evolves it it mutates faster and therefore can potentially have a better resolution for closely related organisms. And it's commonly used for fungal um, community profile analysis. And uh, I think Greg, or someone was asking, well, ITS database, there's a, a list of, there's, a, uh, there's one that's uh, been incorporated into Mother that you can, can use for your analysis. And yeah, so it's called the United ITS um, database. Okay, so for bacterial organisms, but beyond, uh, besides 16S, uh, chaperonin protein has also been used uh, in, again, ITS and uh, RECA genes. The key here is try to identify a gene that's universally present in all, back, all the organisms that you're interested in. Uh, the other key consideration is that there's a good reference database, because um, the first step for uh, for your interpretation is usually comparing your community. Uh, it's usually annotating your community using what's available in the reference. So if you don't have a reference database to compare to, then you cannot really do tax taxonomic analysis. You can only do, you can only generate OTUs and then potentially comparing OTUs. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. So the popularity of these, um, secondary markers are a lot uh, less than the, the 16S. For viruses, uh, it's really quite tricky because there's no real universal genes in, in viruses, but uh, GP23 has been used for T4-like bacteriophage, and RDPD, or RDRP sorry, has been uh, used for uh, the coronaviruses. Uh, and the viral marker genes typically are uh, family specific rather than pen pen viral. Uh, so the, a few considerations. One is that the marker really should have sufficient resolution to differentiate the different communities uh, that you want to study or different groups of organisms that you want to study. So, for example, 16S, it's, uh, it can differentiate uh, most of the uh, genera in, in, in some species, but it doesn't really have strain level uh, resolution. Uh, HSP, HESHOC protein 65, uh, is a, more, is a fast, uh, faster evolving um, uh, protein that's found in Mycobacterium. So, for example, if you want to compare different strains of Mycobacterium, different species of Mycobacterium, you can use uh, HSP65. So, again, depending on the resolution you need, you might have to pick um, the marker gene that has the, the right resolution. Uh, as mentioned, the reference database is needed for taxonomic assignment and for binning. So, um, the availability of a good reference database uh, for the samples that you want to analyze should uh, need to be taken into consideration when you design your experiment. And again, if you want to compare across different studies, you should also check out the studies that you want to compare to what markers they use, um, what experimental protocol they use, and what analysis pipeline they use, and then try to match it as closely as possible in order to be able to compare the results across multiple studies. So the upfront design of your study is, is really quite important rather than just do the sequencing and then f trying to figure out how to best analyze your results after. It's much better to have to design your experiments based on the outcome that you're, uh, you, know, you want to achieve before sequencing. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go over uh, the steps involved in going from sample to sequences. Uh, the reason, again, is to give you some, uh, to highlight some caveats when you're doing your uh, experimental design, uh, and that will facilitate the uh, downstream analysis if you have a good, good design. 
So DNA extraction, there are many uh, uh, kits available from different vendors available, uh, but it has been clearly demonstrated that there's kit uh, specific bias. Different kits can uh, preferentially um, select for different types of different groups of organisms, uh, and, diff uh, and the HMP and other major projects have tried to standardize their extraction protocol. And you can, uh, here's an example of from the Earth Microbiome Project, giving their recommended protocol. But again, if your project, uh, let's say, is trying to isolate DNA from a, a tricky uh, niche that has very little DNA, for example, um, then you might have to tweak your your uh, your uh, extraction protocol. Uh, and sometimes that's not, you can't just match someone else's protocol for Baton. Sometimes that's not possible. Um, the DNA, extra, uh, DNA extraction can also be done after you uh, fractionate the samples uh, and try to s separate your samples uh, based on uh, size fractionation or to, to isolate uh, eukaryotic cells from bacterial cells or from viruses. Um, and uh, we've carried out some of the, uh, we have carried out that type of uh, fractionation uh, for our watershed metagenomics project. But the, one of the lessons we learned, and, and Thea and Mike, who have been doing the bulk of the analysis, can, can definitely provide more information, is that when you do fractionation, the results would not necessarily, would definitely not be the same as if you just take the whole community and then directly uh, amplify specific genes with specific domains of organisms. So again, the experimental design can affect your downstream analysis and may potentially bias your interpretation. Uh, the other uh, issue uh, to consider is that you're dealing with fairly minute amount of, of, uh, of DNA, and moreover, you're dealing with mixed population, so you don't really, sometimes you don't really know what to expect. So contamination can, could easily creep up without you knowing it. So uh, usually uh, it's recommended that you include an extraction negative control using as clean a, a water sample or, or uh, as you can as your, your negative control and, and alternatively use the um, uh, a, a, a suitable negative control to make sure that whatever you found in the negative control uh, is not part of your sample. So this is a good way of trying to detect reagent uh, contamination or potentially water contamination as well. Um, so, you, so bioinformatically, you can then subtract out uh, taxa or OTUs found in the negative samples from your um, experimental samples before carrying out analysis. And this is especially critical if your amount of starting material is really low, as then the, uh, uh, the contamination is mo it's more, it's very likely to show up. So for one study, we looked at a human spinal flu um, sample, and we also looked at human serum sample, and the amount of DNA uh, the amount of microbial DNA or viral DNA in those samples are extremely low, and without using a negative control, you will be actually amplifying uh, DNA just from the reagents or from the um, from the from the water and so on. Yeah, so what we've done was usually just subtracting out the what uh, the common um, taxa or OTUs found in your negative control as, uh, as well as in your samples. That sometimes it's not necessarily the best way to do it, but it's certainly the safest way. I don't know if any other comments from it, well from anyone really. It's it's not a straightforward issue, especially if the sem if the sample ha has very DNA a very low DNA yield. Right. 
Yeah, I've not seen a I've not seen a sample that put on a run like a blank sample that put on a run gave zero uh, and give zero sequences. There's always going to be something, and if nothing, the carryover contamination from the sequencer itself will show up. So yeah, so that's why anyway negative control it's it's definitely recommended. Um, so less so for marker genes, but the host and environment uh, contamination can also creep up when you do metagenomics shotgun sequencing. Um, and as a result of that, the um, usually what, when, do, when doing metagenomics analysis, you have a step where you try to subtract out uh, so-called host or environment contaminants before carry out your analysis. And uh, I won't get into that in more details here because it's less an issue in 16S. Um, so uh, for marker gene analysis, it typically starts with a target amplification using PCR. Uh, so your primers uh, would anneal to a specific region of the genome and um, create sequencing templates um, that then is, is sequenced. The, um, in this case, I'm just showing the uh, V4 region of, uh, of 16S and, and also to show that um, typically when you do amplification, you can attach the sequencing uh, adapters and also the barcode directly to your uh, PCR primer and then carry out the, to amplify your um, uh, substrate, your sequencing substrate in a single PCR reaction rather than multiple steps. But I'll talk a little bit about that later. So PCR primers designed to amplify specific regions of a, ge uh, of a genome. Um, in a, a dirty sample, there might be inhibitors that would interfere with your PCR. Uh, so in one of our studies looking at soil samples, for example, we have, we have to go through a lot of sample cleanup uh, to minimize PCR um, uh, inhibitors in, in those samples. And also in complex samples, you could sometimes get nonspecific amplification, especially if your bacterial load in that sample is low, then the, the specific primers can actually anneal to other, other non-16S template and amplify those. And so you sometimes would want to check your uh, PCR product before sequencing. Uh, the gel uh, size selection may be necessary to clean up some of the PCR products. Um, uh, again, we have some messy samples, and we found that uh, by doing a, essentially a, a run your sample on a gel, excise the band that you want to, to sequence, uh, the old-fashioned way really helped to it really help clean up the samples. Um, the there's actually uh, platforms that you can buy now to um, automate the, the gel size extraction process. Uh, there's a local company called Ranger Genomics, I think. Sorry? Coastal Genomics, and their platform is called Ranger, uh, I think, uh, and that can uh, do that, do the gel size extraction for you on a, on a robot. So, so some experience we had is that if you have a sample that has a, a lot of human DNA, for example, or a lot of host DNA, but very little microbial DNA, in other words, very clean, from our, from our perspective, very clean uh, environment from a host perspective, then you sometimes get nonspecific amplification that's not 16 years. Uh, okay, so a little bit, this came up a bit early, uh, in, in the introductory, but here is the, this, this uh, graph that I mentioned that shows you uh, sort of in each of the V reach, uh, variable re hypervariable regions shown in uh, pink. Uh, the 
sort of the, I actually can read the y-axis, but the, uh, the mean frequency of the most uh, common residue, right? So, uh, so you can see, sorry, actually, let me, let me take that back. The V regions are down here, and the, the pink ones are the PCR primer regions. So you can see V regions, typically, the dominant uh, base it, uh, occurs at low frequency, but the, the conserved regions, of course, the dominant bases occur at a much higher frequency. So these are the conserved regions that you will want to design your primers, and then it should uh, flank the hypervariable regions, the, the uh, uh, regions that you want to sequence. So, uh, but you can also see that, for example, V1, V3, and V6 are more variables than V4 or V5. So that's what I meant before, that the different hypervariable regions could have different phylogenetic resolutions uh, and therefore can give you different taxonomic results. Uh, um, And I'm sure all of you are aware that MySeq or any of the next-gen sequencing platforms uh, can produce a lot of reads, and it's usually an overkill to just put one sample in a single run. So you typically would multiplex multiple samples, sometimes thousands of samples in a single run. Um, but to uh, and and. But in order to do that, you have to be uh, later on be able to demultiplex or to disambiguate reads from one sample from reads from another sample. So this is achieved by using unique barcodes that are incorporated into the uh, uh, amplicons you, try, you, you sequence. So as shown in this graph here, a unique barcode will be put into your um, PCR primer and then will be part of your uh, uh, sequencing substrate that you will sequence. And then we will then use bioinformatics tools to uh, separate out the reads based on the barcodes associated with each of the reads. So each sample will get one barcode effectively. Okay, so uh, the other caveat is um, the way these uh, next-gen sequencing machines are designed, they're highly parallel, but also means that if you put too many uh, uh, too many sequences of the same type on the uh, into a single run, uh, the machines will have trouble uh, uh, will have trouble reading the signals from this, the sequencer. You can, an analogy to that is that if you take a picture of an of, of a really bright region of uh, the sun, you'll have a washout picture, like a white picture, um, and that's the same uh, as in uh, sequencing. That if you have a lot of, uh, so as you know that the, the sequencers go through cycles, if in a given cycle all the spots contain A and therefore the, the spot lit up during that particular cycle, then you'll have essentially a, a bright field in your in your sensor, and as a, as a result of that, it's kind of like the washout effect of taking pictures of a re, of for the sun, for example, having bright. So is that uh, sort of clear why if you put too many samples, uh, too many sequences of the same type on a on a on a sequencing run, you will, uh, the results will not be be very good. You not. Shaking your head? Um, yeah, I'm just <laughs> okay, so that wasn't a. It's for the MySeq. It's for the MySeq, yeah. So, may, so are people familiar with the MySeq platform? Maybe some. Well, I'm not, so maybe that's okay. So, a MySeq platform basically, you have a chip. On the chip, there's spots on the chip, each with the template you're trying to sequence, right? So, uh, each cycle, uh, Base will be incorporated in in the thin, in the chain uh, in the in the um, DNA chain that's uh, been synthesized, and as the incorporation occurs, a light signal is given off, right? So 
if you have if you have a homogeneous sample, then in each of the cycle, all the spots will be saturated, and in the next cycle, none of the spots will be saturated. Then it, and the machine essentially gets confused, it's, and, and that's like taking pictures of really bright sun or really dark spots. You have low contrast there, so that's sort of the analogy of why you should not put samples of the same type all into a single one. Uh, How do you know um, when you have this issue? So usually the we're going to mention Yeah, <laughs> basically it's right there. So so typically when you have a homogeneous sample, let's say you're only sequencing 16s, you need to spike in more um, more non 16s uh, templates, and in this case, Phi X is usually used uh, as the control read right uh, in in a MySeq platform so uh, I can't remember what the recommend ratio is but like if you're doing a metagenomic sequencing I think you only have to spike in one percent of the of my seek yeah, it's always at least five percent five percent okay right so you're losing some spots when you're doing 16S. The alternative is that you can try to pull different marker genes into the same run. Then that would also diversify the pool of sequences you want to, to sample. It's good to have a diverse sequence set when you're running um, a single, when, when, run, when doing a single MySeq run. It did, uh, so it used to be a worse problem. Yeah, so uh, I don't think it was, was not not as much with four five four. And it was also to get around that I should mention. So um, people get around it was, it was mostly a problem with the imaging at the first of the part. So it's sort of um, my understanding is that during the first few bases it sort of calibrates the mm -hmm. imaging. And so if those are all identical, then it causes this problem. So then people started doing other things to get around it, or they upgraded the software where they use variable length and R codes or some other spacer sequence to then shift where the actual lead started. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Really yeah. quite as easy, you know, since they sort of solved it, it's not solved it, but yeah, so in in analogy, camera analogy, well oh, it's actually a camera in the system, but the analogy is that it it determines your aperture or how bright the, the sample is going to be in the first few cycles uh, or at least it used to do that so if you let's just say you're because your 16s sequences the primer region would be very conserved so it becomes a really bad region to actually be using to determine the um, the, the, cap, the capturing threshold and but I think bioinformatics is that problem has been partially solved so now it's less a, less an issue but it's still sort of recommend that you would diversify the samples you put in. Yeah, GQ will actually occasionally ask you to send, um, if, if you're, they know that you're sending a lot of 16S, they'll ask, ask, ask you to send, like, can you send us a whole genome location to sequence along with your 16S? So they'll talk to you about it if it's a problem. Yeah. But of course, you, you're library prep, your sequencing library prep have to be compatible between the 16S and uh, whatever additional sequence you want to throw on the, on the same run. So that's something to, again, to plan ahead when you're de designing your experiment. So now, if, if I have three samples, if I run them in three different domains, to get the thorough sequence, it's better to make 
links the free samples to running separate three commands. When you say samples, uh, you mean? Like if I have three soil samples. OK, but are, you, are they all 16S? Uh, yeah. If it, if it would be combined three samples into one single line with different uh, adapter, it's better than just run three samples in different single lines. Uh, I, I would say most of the people would not run a single sample on a, a high seek lane because that, that's overkill for usually for for my seek there's only one lane uh, so my seek only has a single lane actually in each run so so you won't yeah so so but yeah I mean mo most of the time people would mix multiple samples into a single high seek lane rather than run it one lane per sample for meta genomics on the other hand you could if you need to run one lane per sample but actually my recommendation would be to mix your samples because then uh, you're less likely to have a lane specific bias or other type of bias uh, built in depends on the coverage you want but I don't know if you have a SOP that recommends a certain number yeah, of uh, Yeah. So unless you're really going after like your biosphere or if you have say a soil sample that you really need to exclude, then Yeah. I think the studies shown so far is a million is probably the upper limit you want for sixteen S because after that the really rare uh, Organisms in your community is still not going to be covered because you know the dynamic range of, of abundant organisms and less abundant organisms could easily be uh, thousand tens of thousands of fold or, or millions of fold. So you'll just be re sequencing the, the abundant community over and over again. Uh, so you so for cost effectiveness, usually people aim for a few uh, tenth of thousand to a hundredth of thousands of of sixteen S reads. Per sample, uh, and as the famous quote from Rob Nye is that it only takes a few hundred reads to separate your elbows from your ass. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so basically, if your if your samples are very distinct, you don't need a lot of reads to differentiate them or or to classify them. But if your samples are likely to be more similar to each other, then you might want to increase your coverage. Um, Pardon? Sorry. Shotgun sequence. Uh, you mean how, how many reads you need for shotgun sequencing? I think that really is a, a, that's a wide range depending on the complexity of your community. As I mentioned in the introductory lecture, I think in the acid mite drainage when there's only a handful of organisms, they, they generate about, I think it was 100,000 Sanger sequences to be able to reconstitute the community. But if you have a really diverse community like the soil community, then you can be generating 10 million reads and still not able to assemble your, your assemble the, the context. So it's, it's a huge uh, range depending on the, the diversity of your community. Okay, so a quick, so a few quick comments about one step versus two step amplification. So I already mentioned that if you combine your uh, uh, your PCR primer, your marker gene, sorry, your PCR primer for the marker gene, your uh, barcode, and uh, uh, the Illumina uh, sequencing adapter into your single uh, PCR primer construct, then you can achieve, you can generate the, the uh, sequencing substrate in one amplification, one single PCR amplification step. Um, but some, in some other cases, people prefer to do two-step amplification, and in those cases, the barcode in adapters 
are separate from the Ampercom primer, and, they, and the barcode and adapters are later annealed to the Ampercom primers. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the differences are that the, sync, the one set Ampercons the, it, the requires long primers, and the barcode can actually, in some cases, interfere with the amplification primers. So uh, group, uh, Rob Knight's group has published a bunch of barcodes that they've uh, informatically tested to minimize uh, interference with 16S sequences, but uh, without experimentally... Uh, uh, so, and then they later on use those in their experiments to validate the, that it have less bias. But, but overall, because the longer primers, it's more likely to have interference. Um, the uh, approach with uh, two-step amplification means that you can first test your target primers uh, independently, making sure they work well with your target, uh, target genes or target communities uh, before you apply the barcodes or the adapters. Um, the one-step approach is not really suited for uh, degenerative primers because then uh, you have to design one lone primers for each of the de degenerative variation. Uh, it's more difficult to do that, but uh, the, the two-step approach, you could use degenerative primers or even random primers and then just anneal uh, the... So random primer, that would be in the case of metagenomic studies, but uh, you can then later on anneal the, the barcodes and adapters after the PCI application. The one-step Ampercon uh, is uh, suitable for working with one Ampercon type from many samples. It's simple to generate a set of, bar, a set of, bar, set of uh, uh, primers that already have barcode embedded in them if you just have one uh, Ampercon types. But if you have many different Ampercon types and you want to recycle, reuse your barcode and, your adapt and the adapter, uh, then it, you, you will have to design the PCR primer separately. And then for each of your target, um, you can anneal the same barcodes and same adapters. Uh, and then bioinformatically, even though two different marker genes have the same barcode because they have different sequences, you can still uh, separate them out if necessary. Um, so the one step, of course, is a rapid protocol with a little loss of, uh, of biomaterial. It's much more efficient. So if you have a, a less samples to begin with or, or less material to begin with, then the one step amplification could, give, could save your pr precious sample. The, the two-step amplification uh, has a, a, a longer protocol, and in the process of doing the two-step amplification, um, you could lose some biomaterials. Uh, so as I mentioned, the barcode primers of so 16S genes are available. Uh, uh, at least the sequences are available from Rob Knight's group, and you can order them uh, from any of the... Um, the uh, the primer uh, companies. Sorry. Oh, okay, so so Morgan is advertising his service. Uh, you, you can talk about you, you can talk to him uh, if you have studies that need someone to generate the sequences for you. And uh, the the two step amplification more flexible because you can just buy commercial barcodes from Illumina Bio O or uh, New England Bio. They all sell their versions of the uh, barcodes that are compatible with MySeq. Okay, so that's the the, the sort of wet lab experimental com, uh, components. I'm going to go into more on the, the uh, analysis part, talking specifically about Chime and. Uh, comparing it to Mother, these are the, the two dominant marker gene analysis platforms. And as, as we talked about earlier, they are kind of in, in uh, competition with each other. And, and publications in, from the different camps typically highlights the weakness of the other uh, software. So it's good to, to actually compare the, the, the publications from two um, 
to two different to the two groups, and you can actually learn a lot about the the weakness of each of the the platforms. But at the very high level, uh, just to give you sort of what it, what's the sort of high level difference between Chime and and Mother? Uh, so Chime is a Python interface. Uh, 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 glue together many different programs. So there's a lot of dependencies. You have to install a lot of different programs uh, when you install install Chime. It has done a fairly good job help you streamline the, the installation, but some of the Chime scripts require specific versions of a program, and and if it doesn't get the same ver uh, the right version that it's expecting, it, it's going to throw an error. And so it's sort of the upfront work to set up Chime before you can use it uh, is definitely a lot longer than, than Mother. Uh, and if you're using um, virtual machine, it provides you a, a virtual machine that you can just download and launch on your computer. But the virtual machine is severely limited to the, uh, the like say if you launch it on a desk, on your desktop or laptop, it's severely limited by the, the computer you're using to do the analysis and some of the really large data sets potentially need a really powerful uh, server grade machine with a lot of RAMs and a lot of uh, a lot of disk space and a lot of CPUs for analysis. So VM for doing uh, using virtual machine to do uh, metagenomics or 16S analysis uh, usually uh, scales poorly and is good for learning but not so good for actually processing your own samples. Uh, Mother, on the other hand, is developed essentially by two people, uh, Patch Loss and, and his uh, programmer. Uh, and they've been doing that for the past, uh, I guess, almost 10 years. And so it has a, it's a single program you download, and there's minimum external dependencies. I think between five to five, around five additional programs you have to download separately. And... Uh, it tries to re-implement a lot of the popular algorithms directly into into Mother. So you would just be call, you would still be doing similar analysis as Chime or as using uh, external program, but you would just be using the Mother version of the uh, or the Mother implementation of a specific algorithm. Uh, sometimes the re-implementation is more actually more efficient. Uh, than the original algorithm. Sometimes it's not, so it's it's a bit of a hit and miss. As I'm uh, alluded, it's, it's much easier to install. It's really just a single download, and and you can start using it. Um, however, it, it's designed to work on a single server rather than a cluster. So uh, usually the server has to be fairly powerful. We have in the early days of running Mother. Uh, Back in the late, uh, I think it was 2008, 2009, when I was using it, we used to have machines that, are, that has 512 uh, gigabase of, of memory. So most of your laptop have about 8 gigabase of memory, so just for comparison. And we routinely crash a machine with 512 megabase, uh, gigabase of memory uh, running mother, because it's just really quite a resource hog. They have since developed much better algorithms that minimize the, the memory usage and memorize, minim, uh, minimize the, uh, and, and, the, and making the algorithm more efficient. But uh, still, it's usually recommend if you have the largest data set of, uh, uh, let's say, hundreds of samples, each with uh, a few hundred thousand sequences, you will still need to run this on a machine with a few hundred gigabase of, uh, of memory to uh, and uh, to to uh, to have a successful uh, run, uh, Chime on the other hand does the scale uh, scaling a little bit better, and the algorithms typically are much better at handling uh, uh, the memory uh, issue, and as a result, uh, it, it's typically more scalable. If you have a large data set, you need to analyze. Chime seems to work better than than Mother. Of course, Chime, because it's a wrapper of a diverse set of software, it's a much steeper learning curve, but much more flexible workflow. You can certainly modify the scripts that come with Chime to, to 
achieve uh, to to achieve to to do custom analysis. Um, the mother, on the other hand, it's the workflow works best if you just stay within mother and run the the commands that it it it, it provides rather than trying to uh, use external programs and then bring the the data set into mother. Although I'm sure people uh, you know people do that too, but uh, the one thing good about the mother is that it keep track of the output files it generate in the previous step. So if you can, if you stay within mother, then the workflow it's much easier to keep track of and much easier to do. If you have to bring your data set in and out of mother, then mother the sort of automatic tracking of the the output file from the previous step uh, does not work, and you have to. Be manually tracking all the all the uh, output files that you create, and and uh, and least analysis typically generate hundreds of output files, so it can become a bit of a nightmare uh, keeping track of the output files. Do you yeah, so there's a recent publication that showed that the two, if you use the default workflow for for quality um, control and trimming and so on, Mother and Chime actually gave uh, quite a bit. The, the result, the the trimming results can actually impact your your downstream analysis and interpretation. So I don't really know what the the good answer there is. And again, maybe. Do do it in reference to the data set you want to compare it to, and keep it as consistent as possible across your data sets. Um, Sorry, can I quickly ask from experience? I don't think any, that would be an issue. Both are very well received within the in the community. So one or the other would be fine for publishing for publication purpose. Yeah. So Rob Knight reviews all mother analysis. <laughs> we won't just get the reject. Uh, not likely, unless you did something wrong in your analysis. Yeah. Is it really bad? <laughs> Sorry. Is it really bad? I haven't seen Rob Knight in bad moves, Have you? No, yeah, so he's a jovial fellow from New Zealand, so I don't I don't think I've ever seen him in the band. Um Okay, so this is the overall bioinformatic workflow and we will be going uh, over these um uh and sort of highlighting the different steps for you. And you can keep referring I sort of number the the uh the, each of the major steps. And then I also put them on top of the slide, so you can refer back and forth what what uh, what slides are referring to which steps. Okay. Okay. So you of course first start with your sequence data that's in the fast fastq format, and uh, you also need the metadata uh, about your experiments, and that will be used downstream when you're trying to interpret your results. But for upstream processing, you're mainly just using the sequence data. So there's a pre-processing step that removes the primers, demultiplex, quality filtering, and potentially decontamination if necessary uh, of your samples. After that, uh, after you clean up your samples, the, the uh, what you usually call a clean read, then it's put into a clustering algorithm for OTU picking and trying to reduce the number of raw sequences that you have to analyze. So you're trying to um, remove redundancy in your data set um, and also uh, generate the OTUs in, in the process. And that's followed by uh, two major branch of analysis. One is called taxonomic um, or phylogenetic, phylotyping or phylogenetic analysis. So you uh, do so by take your sequence, do taxonomic assignment uh, based on similarity match to, to a reference database. And then you can build um, uh, uh, sorry, and for the, I should say for the novel sequences uh, that 
does not have a taxonomic assignment, you could keep it as just generic calling OTU1, OTU2, and so on and so forth. And then from there, you will build a, a o, what's called an OTU table, and I'll talk a little bit about that, of course. Uh, that you, that's the, effectively the starting material for your downstream analysis. Uh, in order to do uh, phylogenetic analysis, you first have to align your sequences and to build a phylogenetic tree. So there's a sequence alignment step uh, to take your sequence, align it to the template sequence, and so all, the, all your sequences are in the same alignment space. And then uh, the, uh, the uh, distances um, can be established, the phylogenetic distance then can be established from, the, from your sequence alignment. And this will give you a phylogenetic tree. Uh, so uh, the collectively, the OTU table and the phylogenetic tree forms your process data. And typically, these are in standard formats. Then that could be uh, bring uh, into, well, it could be then uh, used for uh, downstream statistical analysis, network analysis, visualization, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, I'll quickly run through each of this, the steps. So the first step of, of receiving your samples usually is uh, sample demultiplexing. And uh, the reads need to be linked back to the samples that it, it came from using the unique barcodes that, that you introduced during the sequencing phase. Uh, the multiplexing essentially is the, the bioinformatics step to uh, take, the bar, take the reads and then put, um, put the ones that have the same barcodes into the same bin. And, and in that process, it will also remove the, the primer sequences. And um, the, in Illumina platform, the barcodes is actually separate from the from your reads. So, but in on a 454 platform, the barcodes is usually part of your sequencing read. So if you're running a 454 uh, demultiplexing workflow, there's an extra step to remove the barcodes from your sequence sequences. And there's a, a Chime actually has a suite of uh, different scripts to help you prepare your sequence files for analysis. And I provide a link there, and you can actually refer to that for, for your reference. Uh, it's the filtering, the quality filtering step is actually very important. Uh, numerous studies have shown that it, the quality filtering and the preprocessing can affect your downstream analysis. And this is actually a, a lot of the, the conten um, contentions between the mother camp and the, the chime campus to figure out what's the best way of, of filtering your data. Uh, I think mother camp sort of favors more stringent, heavy filtering of your data, whereas Chime, uh, as you can see here, uh, has a much more relaxed view of, of filtering data. But again, it really could affect your analysis results. And I don't know if anyone has comments on what the, uh, what the community consensus right now is, but my personal view is I don't think there's a real consensus um, as to how to best quality filter. But for publication purpose, if you follow the Chime recommendation, I know most likely you won't get a rejection. Or if you follow the uh, mother sort of recommended cons uh, filtering step, then again, you shelter yourself from um, criticisms. Um, and so, so Chime uh, filter by f uh, four different parameters. It looks at the maximum number of consecutive low quality bases. Uh, usually these low quality bases occur at the end of your sequencing read. So effectively, uh, some of the ends, uh, 3 prime end of, a, of the sequence could be trimmed off uh, if the quality drops off too much towards the end of a read. Uh, a read. Um, and you can also define what that, what's, what constitute low quality. So this is where Chime actually use a very uh, relaxed uh, quality score of three, and um, t and I think 
programs like uh, Mother usually use a quality score of 20. And uh, this is the, the fresh score for people familiar with uh, the sequencing terminology. Yeah, that's a huge difference. So yeah, so um, the minimum length of uh, consecutive high quality bases. So this is how much, or oh, yeah, how much of a sequence, it, what percentage of the sequence it's uh, is uh, kept after um, after the quality trimming. So sometimes the quality trimming can trim the sequence too short, and in that case, uh, the this particular score determines what what the what that threshold is so the default is 75 percent so if you have a, a relance of a hundred then after trimming your relance should minimally be 75 base pairs and again this is the recommendation by by chime so um, the last maximum number of uh, ambiguous base, both mother and chime seem to agree that you shouldn't have any ambiguous bases in your uh, reads. Yeah, so this is based on the FRED score, uh, so the the quality score. Uh, so FRED score is a probability of uh, of uh, the base being incorrect. So um, the higher the the higher the, the fresh score, the lower the probability of, of that base being incorrect. So a, a, let's say a fresh score of twenty means a one in a hundred chance that the base is incorrect. A score of um, thirty means one in uh, a thousand. So it's sort of the inverse of of a base ten. Okay. Um, there are other quality filtering tools available. Some, some of these are actually built into Mother and Chime, and you can, again, use them. But And each of them could have their own uh, flavors of, of, of trimming and filtering. And again, I don't think there's really good consensus on what the best way is, but there are numerous, numerous accepted quality trimming uh, SOPs out there that you can follow. Uh, Uh, that depends on the sequence. So, your majority of the reads will not be trimmed lengthwise at all, actually. So, um, if you're using Illumina, so let's say you start with 250, most of the time you probably get 250 back. Not most of the time, but the, the majority of the time, you, uh, majority of your reads would maintain the relens, but some of your reads could be trimmed due to low quality at the end. And also, if um, um, it the the relance the 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 relance um, or really the the minimum relance uh, it, let's say if you have a data set with majority of your reads being two hundred and fifty and minority of reads being really short, let's say only fifty, then you're actually limiting your analysis to that region. Of, of 50 bases because when you do alignment, uh, only uh, if you want to analyze your data using alignment, then only the the window that consists of that 50 base pair would be meaningful for analysis, right? So the rest of the sequence are, uh, are not not being used for for your phylogenetic analysis. So that's why um, it's, it's tr if you if the that's why the minimum length of consecutive quality base usually it's it's um, quite a high percentage rather than you know allowing a much lower percentage. Um, okay. So. Um, this is, I'll skip this, but it just shows you that uh, Chime actually has a workflow determining which uh, parameters to use uh, first. And so this sort of shows you of the four parameters I show here, which ones, uh, uh, 
how how it, how they use how, what the algorithm for for doing the trimming and the the quality control. I'll skip the decontamination because uh, it's less uh, relevant to 16S analysis. Okay, so OTU picking the. Uh, um, as mentioned in, in the introductory, the OTUs are really formed arbitrarily based on sequence identity and, uh, and the cutoff you use. So uh, one caveat to keep in mind is that the sequence similarity of 97% is a, stat, uh, is a threshold for uh, genus level, uh, sorry, for species level uh, differentiation is actually established over the entire 16S gene. And as we've seen before, that the hypervariable regions are, um, on average, more variable than the entire 16S. So, uh, so that's something to, to keep in mind that the traditional definition of a species, when when you're only looking at hypervariable regions, is probably not 97 percent, but something a bit lower than that. But most most of the analysis still use 97 percent as a starting point. Um, there's three different uh, clustering uh, approaches, de novo clustering, close reference, and open reference. And there's uh, some links on how to, uh, more details on how to, recommendations for how to pick OTUs. So I'm going to go through each of these uh, clustering approaches and um, I'm sort of also mindful of the time, so so we'll pick up uh, talking about OTU picking. So as mentioned, there are three main ways of picking OTUs or doing clustering: de novo clustering, close reference, and open reference. And clustering arguably is one of the most important step in your uh, marker gene analysis. So uh, do. I'll try to summarize the, the pro and cons of each approach. Starting with de novo clustering. So this is just grouping sequences based on sequence identity alone. There's no re external reference you're comparing to. You're just comparing the sequences within your data set and group them based on uh, sequence identity. Uh, the the uh, naive way of doing this is to do pairwise comparison of all your sequences and then based on the distance between sequences you cluster them starting with the ones that are most similar to each other and then uh, gradually expand out and that's called hierarchical clustering. Uh, this process requires a lot of disk, mem and disk space and memory and also it's time consuming and it's uh, suitable only if uh, uh, it's suitable um, the, the advantage is that if you have no reference database available, or if your community it has a lot of novel species uh, or poorly characterized species, then this approach would not give you a, would not rely on a, a reference genome, a reference, um, sorry, data, uh, database for uh, clustering. And uh, from the mother camp, I should say, the uh, their analysis showed that average link, average linkage clustering, in other words, uh, grouping based on the average distance uh, in the members uh, within the, the member is the most robust uh, to changes in your input data and also in changes in the algorithm parameters and uh, quote unquote uh, they say that generated o the, it, the process generated OTUs that were most likely to represent the actual distance between sequences um, and it kind of makes sense because it uh, its starting points is just a, a, a just a sequence pairwise sequence comparison and grouping based on that distance. Um, and but because doing pairwise comparison is time consuming, uh, the mother group also recommend that you first group organisms into broad taxonomic groups at the, for example, class or family level, and then you cluster, cluster within each uh, class or each family. This will reduce the number of pairwise comparison you need. In other words, you're only comparing within family. Um, 
So to, just to say that the pairwise distance matrix comparison uh, is not very scalable. If you have a thousand sequences, then it requires a thousand times a thousand comparisons, which is a million comparisons. And if you have a million sequences, that's a hundred million. Is that right? Or anyway, like 10 to the 12th, uh, I guess a, a number of comparison needed. So it's not very, not scalable. So there are uh, greedy algorithms uh, developed to handle the situation. And greedy algorithm simply means first come, first serve. So take the first encounter sequence, group everything. Uh, let's say the first encounter sequence is this one in the middle. Group everything that's close to it uh, distance-wise into into the same group, into into um, the same group, and then rather than consider them pair, in a pairwise fashion before grouping. Um, <coughs> And effectively, only a subset of sequences rather than all sequences are considered. And these subset of sequences are typically called centroid or seed. But as you can imagine, picking the right centroid is quite important. It's very important. And it's been shown clearly that the input order of sequences uh, will affect the centroid. Uh, well, input order of sequences will affect centroid picking. And that, in turn, will also affect the, the clustering you achieve. So if you permutate the, the sequence uh, order, you actually get you could get different clusters. So that's not a desirable trait to have. You obviously want your OTUs to be as stable as possible, right? So, um, so the algorithms uh, the one way to to um, address the issue is that you have to pre-order pre-sort the the sequences based on uh, based on some traits, such as uh, the common ones that uh, pre-sort by the, the uh, sequence length. So typically, the longer sequences um, are higher quality than the shorter sequences. And also, it has more information than the shorter sequences. But actually, uh, the better way to do it is probably by the abundance of uh, 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 sequence. So if a sequence is present in... Um, present many, many times, it's likely to be a correct sequence, and it's likely to also be the dominant organism. So using that as the starting point, uh, stabilize the, the cluster. Um, so you favor the abundant organisms in your clustering. Sorry, could you give us an example of when someone might legitimately use that today, just from what you said about your research, that they would do that? So then I'm thinking, why would you do uh, so, it's, so, so actually, the like it is. I don't. I'm not trying to say don't don't do that. Uh, the the greedy algorithm have been shown to perform quite well, almost as well as. Uh, 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 well, it, it's been shown to to perform almost as well as the the naive approach, and. Uh, the I guess the maybe a better way to answer is that the the de novo clustering approach would not be biased by the reference, okay. right? So if you have reference that's not very rep database that's not very representative of your community, then you may not want to cluster based on that reference because that might actually um, uh, bias your your cluster by bias the OTUs that are formed. Um, a specific example, um, I don't know, anyone want to chime in on the issue? I mean, I could point you to a paper where uh, Patch Law's uh, developer mother has demonstrated that why he favors de novo clustering and why he thinks that approach most accurately represents the structure of the community than the, uh, the other approaches. So it's more time consuming, but it put, it's more, it's le the least biased approach, to say, yeah. And by sorting, by pre-sorting your input, that reduced the the um, the issue uh, with stability of your clustering, and um, and the the based on the abundance 
also seem biologically a reasonable thing to do. So is that uh, sorting automatically, or you kind of have to do it manually before? Uh, so some tools pre-sort it for you automatically. In Chime, um, the U class, I think, does not pre-sort it, so you have to sort it yourself first. Yeah, so it's so do pay attention to make sure the clustering algorithm uh, either pre-sort it for you somehow, or you sort the the, the sequences to minimize uh, uh, clustering um, flat, uh, fluctuation in your cluster membership. Okay, so close reference, it's the opposite of, of the novel clustering. Essentially, you match sequences in your data set to existing database of reference sequences, and the unmatched sequences are simply discarded. Um, and, this, and typically, you will have a, a similarity threshold uh, for the matching. So uh, sequences that are considered novel uh, will be discarded. This it's quite it's fast and it could be paralyzed uh, onto multiple machines, so it, it's very scalable, um, and it's also suitable if if you have a comprehensive reference database, and in other words, you don't really care about put the novel uh, sequences in your data set, and in some situations, that might might be the case. And the other advantage is that it allows you to do taxonomic comparisons across different data sets and different markers. So imagine that you have generate a data set of the V, let's say the V3 region of 16S, and someone else has the V6 region of 16S. But if you do close reference clustering, then both sets of data are now matched to um, the reference. Then uh, you can then compare the two data sets based on the ta taxonomic assignment of the best match in the in the reference set. Um, so the downside, of course, is novel organisms are missed or discarded. So uh, it's definitely not recommended if you're doing with de dealing with environmental samples. Uh, typically, those are much less well characterized than say human microbiome. Okay, so the open reference theoretically uh, has the best of both worlds, but what's been shown is that the open reference approach, the reference database you use could bias your cl uh, clustering. So, uh, but this approach essentially first, uh, you do a close reference clustering, and then the unmatched sequence, instead of discarding them, you then do a de novo clustering of just the unmatched sequences. So that cuts down the amount of comp computational uh, resource needed to do the de novo clustering. Um, it's suitable if uh, a mixture of novel sequences and known sequences are ex uh, to be expected in your, in your data set. And um, this is the Chime recommended approach. And in the uh, <laughs> One of the studies that we point out in the in the tutorial, they show sort of based on their analysis the the new um, open reference based approach um, worked the best with their uh, simulated and mock uh, and mock community data sets. So uh, the key take home message I think for for marker gene analysis is is actually this slide. Once you have, uh, once you do the clustering into OTUs, you have to pick a representative sequence for that OTU, and this means that all the downstream analysis that you're doing effectively treat all the members in that given OTU uh, as one single organism, right? So it, they're all represented by uh, this representative sequence. So if your OTU picking is poorly done, um, then your representative sequence would not be a very representative sequence of the day, of the underlying um, of the members in that OTU, um, and the how and there are several ways to pick representative sequences. The most common way is probably based on abundance, assuming that the most common uh, members of that OTU is the representative. Uh, is the rep can be used as a representation for the entire OTU. Uh, 
some would favor the centroid approach. In other words, the the OTU that uh, sort of um, at the center of of the cluster. So in other words, it's roughly equal distance from all the other uh, members of the OTU. Uh, it's the most representative. Um, and then some use the lens of the OTU again. Uh, arguing longer reads have more information, so why not use that as the most representative? Um, and if you do a close reference OTU picking, then typically you would take the existing reference sequence as the representative sequence of the OTU uh, with the, the argument that the reference sequence is the one that's been characterized the, the most uh, already. Uh, not recommended is to pick randomly. That usually doesn't end very well, um, but some people do that. Uh, and also not recommended is to pick the first sequence in an OTU, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the in the the list of, of members in that OTU. Again, that's fairly arbitrary and no, um, but that's been done before as well. So, okay. So, quick word on. Uh, uh, part of the cleaning up uh, is to remove chimeric sequence. And uh, 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 a common way to detect uh, chimeric sequence is, is basically by looking at alignments. And if, you, if there's a situation where one end of the, align, one end of, the um, of your sequence align the best to a template uh, a re or a reference uh, and the uh, other end of your uh, query sequence align the best with another uh, another uh, reference or, or organism or another template, then that's a sign that your uh, sequence can potentially be a chimeric sequence. Um, typically, you would also want to take the abundance of that particular sequence into account. And if it's a really abundant sequence, then it may be a novel sequence rather than a chimeric uh, read. So a sign of a chimeric sequence would be that it's low abundance and, um, and that it matches two different um, and two unrelated uh, organisms. Okay, so since OTUs don't have names, and we typically like to refer things with a name, uh, we usually assign the taxonomic uh, name to an OTU. So for close reference, usually you would just transfer the taxonomic, uh, the the taxonomic name of the reference sequence as the the, the name for your for that particular OTU. Uh, in open reference and de novo clustering approaches. Uh, that it's done using um, it's done by transferring the uh, annotations of the from the reference data to your OTUs, and this is done through a similarity search uh, process. So, um, so because this process is uh, because this is a a, a step that. Um, it, um, how do I say this? Because this this step is is it's done uh, to do the matching, and there are different ways to do it. It's important to report how you how the matching is done uh, in your publication and which taxonomic database you use for the for the matching. Uh, here's a sort of graphic um, graph to show what I what I just said. Imagine you have to, uh, the different OTUs without names. Um, you can specify the uh, matching algorithm, uh, basically a similarity search algorithm uh, to match the OTUs to entries that are found in the database. So you can see here that the, uh, the process is algorithm dependent, but also it's uh, database dependent. So that's why what, what I meant by that the, um, when you do the, the taxonomic assignment, it's important to report the algorithm and the database. And at the end of the uh, assign, uh, the, the assignment, your and your 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 OTUs will be given a taxonomic name. Do, do we like integrate all these different ways into a single output? The, different identification strategies with different database and 
somehow pick the best, the best match and use uh, uh, Well, in Mother, you, you can, yes, you can try different um, matching algorithms and then consolidate the results. But again, using the same database, I don't know if you can do it against multiple databases um, in trying to consolidate. Do you know, anyone know a tool that could essentially do the, get the consensus of the matching algorithm and the consensus of the There's database? Yeah, so you still have to take the results and potentially consolidate it yourself. You could parse the results and then just list the, the hits and then try to come up with uh, the, the, the most popular annotation as the, the right one, I suppose, as the, the cumulative annotation for your entry. Yeah. But that's a good, maybe a good tool to develop. Um, but the, the thing is different databases do have slightly different names for the organisms, so consolidating them wouldn't be as uh, straightforward. And here are some of the differences. So RDP it, uh, is the most similar to NCBI taxonomy. It, it actually incorporates NCBI taxonomy. And it also has a built-in tool to call RDP classifier that uh, would uh, allow you to do a rapid classification based on KMER counts. Um, the green gene is the one favored by Chime, as I mentioned before, and Silva is the one fa favored by Mother. Um, then there, I don't, um, again, there's very, besides what I mentioned that the, the template, how they generate the, the alignment template are different. There's also um, naming and taxonomic, minor naming and taxonomic differences. and and also how they rank the, uh, as you know, you can go from, um, uh, for, for a proper taxonomic name, there's different, what's called ranks of uh, taxonomy. And these databases don't necessarily have the same rank uh, for, um, for a given organism. So for example, that, uh, just theoretically speaking, let's say bacteroides in, um, uh, green gene could have all these ranks uh, going from the most broad to the, the most narrow but in um, and in Selva um, some of the, some of the ranks might be missing or might be named uh, differently or it might be grouped differently so it, it's not always straightforward to compare across databases that's a harder question than comparing across um, different matching algorithms, which has been done already. It is difficult to link your own database? No, you can have your own custom database. Yeah, you can certainly have your own annotate, annotated set of uh, uh, sequences to use as a database. Yeah, and that's actually one approach some people do is you take... Hi, John. That's uh, John, the instructor for the third day. Hi, John. Uh, okay, so there's a, a potentially useful approach when you're trying to characterize a community that doesn't have a good reference genome is that you actually take the most abundant organisms in, in, uh, in that community as the, the references and you build uh, as well as possible your, tech, your target taxonomy database based on those organisms. So. Um, and and do your cluster clustering and OTU calling that way. That potentially give you a, a more uh, custom uh, data uh, OTU uh, taking results to to deal with. Uh, okay, so the taxonomic summaries uh, very often is shown as a bar graph, uh, just for each of the samples shows the relative abundance of each taxon uh, in the in the sample so of course same color represent the same samples and you can see that this first one has slightly more yellow uh, whatever the yellow organism is compared to some of the others and these ones have more orange 
uh, taxon. <coughs> okay, so uh, from the OTU assignment, uh, the OTU res uh, the results are usually summarized in a sample by observation matrix called the OTU table, and it's simply a table that uh, has samples on the y-axis and uh, OTUs on the x-axis. So it shows you how many uh, how many uh, uh, reads are in each of the OTUs in each of the samples. Um, and sometimes you so this table can again get quite big because you can have thousands of samples and thousands of OTUs. Uh, so in order to uh, condense the, the storage requirement uh, instead of storing OTU table as a, as a, a two-dimensional table uh, usually it's encoded in this standard format called the biome uh, format yeah okay So, so the short answer to that is you could compare abundance, uh, but best to do so within your own data set rather than comparing relative abundance across multiple data sets. Uh, it's not, it's 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 less straightforward when you're trying to compare across multiple uh, data sets based on relative abundance. And in those cases, maybe the presence and absence of OTUs would be, it would be a coarser comparison, but it would be a more, uh, it would be a, it would be less subject to potential experimental uh, biases in how your sample is collected, how your sample is processed, and so on and so forth. Yeah. But if you're all the samples are processed the same way and collected, collect the same way, processed the same way, uh, then the relative abundance is meaningful in that sense. So, are they comparable across runs? Yeah. Should, yeah. But you would, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later, but you would re typically re um, verify or subsample your uh, samples when you compare. So, so you try to read, try to have all the same number of reads for each of your um, samples before you do the comparison. Then in that case, relative abundance is also uh, meaningful in that sense. Should we look the singletons or the Nowadays, people tend to throw away the singletons uh, and and treat them as um, um, potential sequencing errors. And a lot of the algorithms, including cluster algorithms, or uh, in mother it's called pre-clustering, would also assume that if singleton is highly similar to a, um, an OTU, it would collapse that singleton into an OTU. And, and very, uh, sing singletons are very different from anything else likely to be experimental artifacts. Um, and I think the, the marker gene based analysis is very good for doing a, a get the community profile of abundant organisms in the community, but it doesn't really do very well when if you're interested in is in the really rare organisms in the community. Yeah, like, like it's right. So, but so, but if you're if you're interested in rare organisms in a community, then a, a targeted PCR direct targeted approach is more suited. Than than um, than uh, uh, microbiome approach. Uh, yeah. With mother, do you get this biome format as well? Yeah. So mother and chime both support biome. Okay. Um, so the a few words about the biome format. It's more efficient inherently large amount of data because instead of uh, storing things in these matrix and you'll notice that there's some uh, OTUs that are not present in in a, in a sample at least not I should say not detected in a given sample and it's kind of wasteful to store this information right because you can infer that in the biome file if 
if a if sample one has no OTU three entry, you can infer that as that it's not detected, rather than store uh, uh, explicitly store a zero in your in your file. So using that approach, it you, it basically uh, reduce the amount of data that need to be stored. It uh, it's also uh, encapsulate. There's in, uh, it's able to keep the metadata together with the observational data. So here, the metadata can only be encoded in the headers. But in the biome file, you can actually explicitly in, uh, attach um, metadata to your samples uh, in in the same file. So it's much uh, you don't have to worry about missing meta metadata, uh, losing the metadata during the file doing file transfer and so on and so forth. Uh, it's well supported by multiple softwares, and I list the uh, most uh, the software that the common softwares that support the biome format. You can see Chime. MGRAS that we covered, uh, PyCross, which Morgan will talk about, Mother, so on and so forth, all support the biome format. And there's uh, tools that specifically deal with uh, the conversion of biome format to other common format, uh, such as tap delimited file and so on and so forth for you. So um, it's a community standard now, basically. OK, so the next step, uh, not the next step, but the the other uh, component of the um, uh, marker gene analysis is sequence alignment. So the sequences must be aligned in order to generate uh, phylogenetic trees. Uh, and uh, the phylogenetic trees can be used uh, for diversity analysis. When you generate OTUs, there's no implicit distance between OTUs. OTU1, the, the difference between OTU1 and OTU2 and between OTU1 and OTU3 uh, it's not explicitly, uh, 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 sorry, explicitly, implicit, implicitly uh, stated. Essentially, each OTU is treated as a as a as a single organism, and all being equal. Um, the um, tree-based approach, on the other hand, gives you um, distance information, and um, there are traditional approaches that are not very scalable to the large amount of data that we have. So uh, new tools such as PyNAST, um, well, relatively new, I guess, that's based on the template. Uh, um, that's templates available from the green gene with the, um, um, the, the um, silver databases are um, Available to to fast to generate uh, alignments faster and and fairly accurately. Okay, so uh, quickly that once you have the alignment, you can generate phylogenetic trees uh, because a large amount of data. One you some of the older methods are not as scalable again. So uh, fast trees seem to be the the common tool that people are using to generate. Uh, maximum likelihood trees that are uh, that consist of thousands of, of uh, uh, nodes, and it's the one used by Chime uh, by default. Okay, so I, I mentioned this already. As we multiply samples, the, the sequence depth can vary from sample to sample, and this in turn affects the rich and diversity measures of your downstream analysis. As you can imagine, if you sample a, uh, if you sample, uh, a particular environment more deeply, you're going to see more organisms, uh, more rare organisms in that sample than if you uh, sequence it to a shallower depth. So the uh, common practice is that you verify your samples uh, to the same level of sampling depths. In other words, the same number of reads in each of the samples. Uh, and there are some alternative approaches that have been proposed instead of, ver uh, instead of truncating your uh, samples to a fixed number of reads, you might be able to control uh, uh, the, the um, um, control the, di the, the diversity uh, by doing a variant transformation. Uh, so the basic principle is that uh, you would try to uh, reduce the, uh, as, as your sampling size gets bigger, the, the variance also gets bigger. So you will try to control um, 
the variations in each of the samples to bring them to the same level of variation. So even though you have different number of reads in each of the samples, they roughly uh, scale back to the same um, variance. But that approach doesn't seem to be favored anymore given that nowadays you, sequencing is, is cheaper and you potentially just generate more reads uh, for, for, for undersampled uh, or undersequenced sample. Yeah, you should you should verify your data set before downstream analysis. So you're saying that like before when they have a, a bad sample, they just resequence it rather than downsampling all the rest. Yeah, but you still won't be able to get consistent exact exactly the same number of reads. So you still have to. It's just that like you don't have to downsample as much. Yeah. Uh, okay, so quick words on the the diversity uh, measures. So alpha diversity. Uh, it's uh, it's measuring the diversity of organisms in one single sample. Uh, richness simply means the number of species or taxa or number of OTUs observed uh, or estimated in a given sample. Uh, evenness, on the other hand, is the relative abundance of each taxon in the, in the same in one sample. And the diversity measure, uh, there are different ones, but all of them effectively try to take both evenness, in other words, the relative abundance of the different taxon, taxa in your single sample, and also the richness, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the um, number of uh, taxa found in your sample uh, into account. And the most common ones are uh, listed here. There's Shannon entropy, the phylogenetic distances. And we'll use some of these in the in the tutorial, but we also, uh, will, if you're interested, we can show you the um, exactly how they're calculated and the formula and so on. Okay, so uh, so this is just to show that uh, looking at alpha diver, uh, you looking at the. Uh, alpha diversity across, uh, of the same data set, of, of the same sample, I should say, using different OTU picking method can actually give you uh, slightly different results. And not surprisingly, the open OTU and um, the de novo approach, which do not discard the novel sequences, um, um, giving you higher number of OTUs than the close uh, reference clustering approach. Okay. In, Sorry, I hate to say it though, we even give those three graphs, I can't see a huge amount of difference. So I think what you were saying does it really matter. You know, I'm not seeing one being hugely different from the other. I just kind of think. Yes, I have my axis. Oh, yeah. I can see I'm too old, I can't see this graph. <laughs> uh, okay, so they are very different. They are slightly different. There's not a lot of OTUs in this particular example, but. Um, it's about 20 versus 30 to 40. Oh, yeah. Okay, so the y-axis is different. Yeah, so yeah, so I should say that the y-axis, this one ends at 30, this, these two are 40. Not the best pictures, I have to admit. Um, the beta diversity, on the other hand, measures the difference of diversity across samples or across environments. And again, a list of common beta diversity measures that you can use. Uh, there's Unifrac, uh, which takes a phylogenetic tree and then calculate the percentage of unique branch uh, unique uh, branch lengths uh, in the sample versus a, another sample. Um, so it's a it's a one that considers the phylogenetic distance. Breaker, this on the other hand, takes the OTU table and simply look at the OTU abundance, so relative abundance of OTUs in your samples. The Jakar measure, on the other hand, just looking, again, taking the OTU table, but only look at the presence and absence of OTUs. Okay, so there's other OTU, sorry, there's other beta diversity measures uh, based on both OTU and, phylo and phylogenetic trees available in Chime and, and Mother. Um, Do I want to? 
Well, so, so here's a quick sort of summary of how beta diversity analysis is done. First, uh, you have a table showing the relative, um, this, uh, sorry, not the, 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 the pairwise distance uh, in your samples. Then, uh, for example, all the samples, of course, are uh, uh, um, con uh, highly correlated with each other. And whereas uh, you can see here that sample one and three are more similar to each other than in sample two and seven. Uh, sorry, sample one and two or one and three. Um, and once you have that information, uh, you can transform the the information into lower dimensionality display uh, for visualization purpose. So instead of Summarizing, summarizing the results in a pairwise fashion, uh, you, you can use uh, several approaches to uh, show you which samples are more similar, similar to each other than other samples in two-dimensional or three-dimensional spaces. Okay, uh, so the Unifrac, as I mentioned, it's, all the OTUs are mapped to a, a single phylogenetic tree, and the unique branches in the tree that correspond to a single sample is used as a measurement of how different the samples are from each other. So sh uh, shared nodes are either ignored in the unweighted version or they're discounted in the weighted version. Um, the, what's been shown is that the way the Unifrax is sensitive to uh, uh, to certain experimental biases, but the um, it's more robust when you have a lot of rare uh, organisms in your in your sample, whereas the unweighted Unifrax would effectively treat the rare organisms uh, the same as as um, as the abundant organisms. So it would um, effectively be. Uh, if you have two, let's say you have two samples that share the, the most abundant species, but their rare species are completely different. In the unweighted unifrac uh, calculation, the because the it's unweighted, the abundant species and the rare species are treat uh, 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 have the have equal weight. The samples are going to show up as very different because the uh, the rare species dominate the the calculation, whereas the weighted unifrax would sort of discount the rare species, so your uh, samples are going to show up to be more, uh, that's sure the common uh, abundant species is going to show up more. Um, Could you just tell us what the red squares versus green circles are? Those are uh, different um, samples. So, uh, so you can... So sorry. So each node is a tag. Each node is a, a taxon, an OTU, and it's saying that uh, this particular taxon is found in green sample. That taxon is found in green sample, and that's found in green sample. And these three are found in the um, red samples. Right? Same thing here. And if you calculate the number of uh, unique branches, then you can see that this one. Where the um, the, the taxa from different samples are uh, more distantly related to each other have a, will have a longer branch length than the ones that uh, that are more that have um, organ uh, taxa more similar to each other. Does that make sense? So the the then the branch lengths sort of give you a, a approximation of how uh, similar the Two uh, uh, the two communities are from each other. So these two don't share any um, tags are uh, maximally different community. They, they don't overlap at all. Whereas these, uh, they're more, they're interlaced, so they're more similar. Okay, so uh, instead of going to the detail of principal coordinated analysis, 
just want to give you an analogy what what it's trying to do. So it's trying to take a high, higher dimensional project and project it in a lower dimension. So from in this sure example, it's going from a three dimensional project into a two dimension, and then you can think. Uh, so so you can think about this problem a bit. Uh, sorry, keep flipping. You can think of this problem as how. Uh, when, after the projection, how much information is retained. So you can see on the right-hand side here, the shadow, even though it's in two dimension, can still tell you that it's, it's a chair. It, whereas in this case here, this shadow here has very little information available. It, it could be anything. It could be a chair. It could be a stool. It, so this is a poor projection, and this is a much better projection. So the, the aim of the principal coordinate analysis is to give you give you the maximum informative projection at a lower dimension to help you uh, separate out the um, samples based on the most salient features or most salient uh, so in other in in the jargon it's trying to account for the most variations when it's reducing the dimensionality uh, so this is a plot generated using chime showing you, and I think many of you probably have seen some uh, similar plots, but essentially the color shows the different uh, sampling sites, for example, and each dot is a, is a sample, and you can see that there are three distinctly distinct clusters that um, separate out by the sampling sites. And these dots, of course, are colored based on the metadata that you provide. Um, question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in the modern pipeline, at least, when you get to the PCOA part, you have the choice of doing M and M M D S plot as well. How do you know which one to pick? Uh, good question. Anyone has an answer for that? I've noticed in the literature it's like 60, 40, and I have no idea <laughs> yeah. how they're picking up. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few different methods for yeah. Scaling, so is there yeah. a reason you pick one over the other? Uh, there's probably slight variations on it. Um, I don't feel just as hard as they say. So there's conical uh, CCA, which is conical component analysis as well, which is a common one. Um, I, I think some people sort of believe in one or the other sometimes. Um, I don't know. I don't have much more information. Uh, it's not, yeah, it's not a, it, mathematically they're different, but it's hard to say math. Given that they're different mathematically, how does that translate into biological significance? So, right. so what I'm doing right now is picking the one with the least amount of stress. Like, is that legitimate? Uh, stress to run, you know, uh, stress no, no, like the the, the, the ten. Stress, like how bad the modeling is. Yeah. So, okay. so, so basically, pick the ones that fit the mo fit your data the best. Trying to those numbers will give you an indication of how good your representation is okay. of the higher dimensional space, right? So certainly choosing the within NMDS, if you have a bunch of predictions, you want to choose the one with the less stress, least stress. That makes sense. Um, yeah. So I haven't seen a good analysis of when to use one or the other. Um, I guess you can do both. Yeah. When they don't. Yeah, when they don't agree. <laughs> Well, when they don't agree, you probably want to make sure that um, that what is in your data is actually being represented in these plots, right? It might be an indication that there's some variability in your data that isn't being represented, and that maybe neither of them are appropriate, actually. Does an NMDS take a distance plot? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, we can talk about that offline no, maybe. It's too, the same but question. Yeah. Yeah, it is the same. Question. It's just different methods to, to, take, to do the same thing. Okay. Yeah. And there are different assumptions. Again, the math if you read about the, the method, they will tell you what the mathematical assumptions are. But to translate that into biological assumptions, it's just not not always straightforward. And a lot of these methods were developed using mock community will use uh, 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 simulated com uh, data sets. So they're also not always. Uh, but they are with the Well, no. Some of them start with uh, with uh, correlation um, co correlation coefficient rather than so rather than distance. Yeah. So PCA started with the distance. Uh, sorry, uh, PCOA starts with a, a correlation rather than with a distance. Also, like the, the distance measure of one of the big effects as Uh, okay, so the next way to represent the, the uh, results is just show it in a in a phylogenetic tree. Uh, sorry, not a phylogenetic tree, uh, a sample tree uh, using hierarchical clustering. So each of the leaf is is a, a single sample. So it's not not text out anymore, but each of is a sample. And uh, of course, the ones that are closer to each other are interpreted as samples are have more similar microbiome profile. So um, the downside of this approach or this type of visualization is that it forces your um, samples into bifurcating trees. So then what, what do you call a cluster? Do you cut it off at say this branch length? So this is a cluster, but then this two are not a cluster anymore. Well, where do you cut off? Uh, and call a cluster. So this type of approach uh, may be meaningful if you have a f only a few um, sample types. And what you're hoping to see is that you see a two, two, two giant clusters, one represent each of your sample types. Then, But in the case where you have a lot of different sample types, then these type of approach uh, of visualization can actually um, confuse the, the, the results. And in that case, Something like uh, principal coordinate analysis would be more reasonable. Okay. Uh, actually, so yeah, so the, this is just talking about marker genes versus metagenomics. So I think most of these are self, pretty self-evident by now. So marker genes are less expensive. Uh, computationally, it's also easier to, to deal with. Um, mainly provide taxonomic classification rather uh, or taxonomic profiling rather than functional. Um, for 16S, uh, we have a pretty good handle at the phylum level of the, of the microbial diversity. So at least you can fit your data into some sort of class, uh, taxonomic classification scheme. Um, and you also, because you amplify specific target region, uh, it's relatively free of host DNA contamination. The shotgun metagenomics approach is still much more expensive. Um, it usually requires a lot more computational resources, and but it does provide both directly both taxonomic and functional profiling. However, because our database for uh, sequences are not nearly as, are not uh, complete, not that comprehensive. Uh, there will be many more unassigned gene fragments that simply have no representation in an annotated database. So you, yeah, you might get a fragment that you just don't know what it is, and you have to. And you can't really analyze that fragment properly. So there's a lot more wasted data, and it's also. Uh, depending on the sampling approach, more prone to host and environment contaminations. 
uh, it's also been shown early, quite early on in metagenomic and microbiome comparison that uh, the bacterial phylum could vary greatly across samples, but the, the corresponding functional um, classification is much more stable uh, across samples. So some sort of interpret that as comparing at the functional level may be more meaningful than comparing at the bacterial uh, taxon level. Uh, in other words, some different taxon in different samples might be fulfilling the same uh, function um, in, in that ecosystem. I'll skip PyCross because you're going to get a whole lecture on that.